it's a fluorescent light. People look up and look at these little the outlet for this tube, the little the, the little aperture, and they can look for lights on in the house. So, uh, so also look at some energy in terms of passive and active, and there's a picture that'll come up in the moment. You know, literally how you place trees on your property can either cause shade. Um, one of the ways we've used passive solar energy is we've dug our house into the ground, into the, into the side of the hill, and that naturally the hill, the, the, the heat hill cools and heats our house. We wait for the cycle, or what's called gray water. Our house is also, also has that. Um, energy efficient appliances and lighting, like LED lights and refrigerator, huge improvements in these things in the last few years. Living roofs, green roofs, we actually plant stuff on your roof, it cools your roof, and, and also provides the actual roofing material. Okay? Alternative building materials, you guys will hear me talk about it's straw bales. Straw bales are a waste product from producing staples, our grains, you know, whether it's from wheat or rice, we eat straw, and they're super insulating, and they're a waste product. If they get burnt, they, they contribute a lot to air pollution, to those little PM10, the small particles that get into your lungs. Okay? Alternative materials, and then of course, recycle, restore, reuse. Um, in our house, just about everything is recycled, restored, and reused. All the wood, all the doors, the windows, um, and it's a lot of, a little more work to do it that way, but it's also kind of fun because every every little part of the house kind of has a story. Okay. Nice little slide if you're interested in this stuff. Most of you would just want to just look at this. But look at some of the things we can do to build smart. We've got lazy in our building. We we want to just take two by fours and just take a big old. Uh, uh, nail gun and blast away at those 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 uh, two by fours and build houses very quickly and um, and not very smart. So there's so much we can do, and a lot of it's a, it, like a lot of this is a bit of a change in lifestyle, right? Um, I have to run out once in a while on a on a cloudy day and start the generator. I've got to go out and and, and pump water with a generator from from our well. I don't get to just turn on the faucet and always have nice flowing water. Okay, uh, why are we still wasting so much energy? It's because our energy is very cheap. If you guys, how many of you travel to other countries, other than Mexico, which is still pretty cheap, but gasoline, <laughs> petrol is what we call <laughs> South Africa is four or five times more expensive in other countries. We produce a lot of it here, and we've got subsidies and all kinds of stuff. It's relatively inexpensive. Of course, your grandfather and that saying, well, I always want to, I pay it only 20 cents a gallon. Well, we're still super cheap, okay? And that's subsidies. Um, so now we've, we've, we've turned that corner, and we're looking at, at focusing on our tax breaks and our subsidies from the government towards local renewable energy, okay? Um, for example, I just found out last week that I can get 50% rebate on some new batteries. My batteries are already starting to struggle after only about four years. My lead acid batteries, like kind of like your, they're kind of like deep cycle like car batteries, and I, I'm going to try to get some of those lithium ion batteries. And there's a new government program that will subsidize 50% of that. So. That's how we can encourage folks to do this. The price of solar, for example, in your home has come way down. And there were some really good pro programs to subsidize that, to give you tax breaks or to actually give you direct money for putting solar on. Okay? Types of solar, solar energy. Um, we're going to talk the book. I really would encourage you to pay attention, especially to these next couple of slides, because... Um, it gets quite complex, but there's really, when we're talking solar, now we're going to talk about one of the sources, which is, is and it's also one of the principles of this class and sustainability, right? Using, using the sun's energy as effectively as possible. So we can use solar energy in two main ways in, in, in the real world. There's more than this, but I'm 
I'm going to focus it down into two main ways. We can use the sun's heat to directly heat uh, buildings and port but it's actually light energy that comes down from the sun, but it, it, when it gets into our atmosphere and turns into infrared, it provides heat, all right? So we can help heat our buildings, we can heat water. And our house, our whole house is heated with solar thermal heating. In other words, we, we heat water in a, in a heat collector for our water, and it goes under our floor, and it heats up, uh, heats, heats up the house. That's our heating system. Okay, um, we can lots of parts of the world. We can use solar thermal cooking, cooking, uh, uh, you know, those little solar ovens and things like that. Okay, so that can be direct heating. Another way we use solar energy is is to make electricity. Okay, and underneath that, there's two main ways. First one is solar thermal systems, and the second one is photovoltaic. Okay. So if you kind of get a handle on this, this will make it a lot simpler when people are talking about solar energy, okay? So solar thermal, if you guys have ever driven out to, <clears throat> excuse me, on 395, you're driving out to Four Corners, um, and you hit the 58, there's these really cool looking mirrors, and they track the sun, they're parabolic mirrors. I'll show you a picture of them in a moment. And they actually, they actually reflect the light back onto a, uh, onto a little tube that has a oil in it, a, 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 a synthetic oil, and they heat up that oil. And then that goes to run steam turbines that produce the electricity. So those are parabolic mirrors. If you've been to Vegas, how many people have seen that huge uh, even power project out on the, on the way to Vegas? Yeah, so that's the next one. That's called a heliostat. So basically, you're, you're reflecting the sun's uh, light back onto these central towers. So I think they have, what, three or four central towers that are super bright, and those are the ones that birds have been getting too close to and getting fried up. There's been a big controversy about that. But that's the heliostat. But those are all solar, solar thermal systems. You're not making electricity directly, you're heating up a oil or a water or some liquid, something, the thermal means, means you're heating up some kind of liquid and you're driving a steam turbine, just like you would do in a regular power plant. The last one is photovoltaic, and that's mostly what you see on houses. You might see water heating panels on houses, you kind of need to know the difference, you wouldn't know that off by hand, but mostly you're seeing photovoltaic. Those are the crystalline ones, they're real shiny, and basically, sun hits that, and it's generating electricity directly. It's making directly right, electricity right on the spot. So, um, back a little bit about just heating with the sun directly, um, passive and active, active solar. Okay. Um, You'll have to kind of read up about this, but for example, if you look in that middle middle panel there, we've got sunlight coming through a window and basically heating. You normally, you have darker, darker floors and you have something that'll store the heat like concrete or, or tile. And it basically, in that top picture, you're basically directly capturing the sunlight. If you notice, there's two, two lines here. In the summer, you have a lot a bigger overhang on your house to where it doesn't get window in the summer because you don't need that extra passive solar. You're not doing anything for the to put this window pane in the right place, right? So in the summer it's it's missing the, the window and it's not open the house. In the winter, when the angle of the sun's lower, it's coming in and heating the house. The other active solar where I actually have a panel on top of my house. And I actually heat up water or, or water with antifreeze, some kind of some kind of liquid, and then I run it through the house and I and I release that heat. I have a, a heat exchanger inside the house and I release that heat into the house. I do it, I have a bunch of tubes, just actually a plastic tubes that I put in concrete, and they run all through my floor, 
and that's what releases the heat, okay? And obviously, there's some advantages and disadvantages to that, okay? Solar thermal, there's a picture in the top there of one of those heliostat with the central power. Um, and then in the bottom, we've got what they'll call the parabolic mirror. If you look at the bottom one, you'll see there's a little line going down the middle of that. And it's in that little line in the tube that you have mostly a synthetic oil. It's a synthetic oil that gets superheated and then goes to a central uh, generating station where it's turned into steam. And that steam drives a turbine. That turbine is a thermo... Uh, is, is an uh, a electromagnet, and that electromagnet produces electricity. So, again, this is solar energy, not like the next one. Solar panels, photovoltaic. Photo light turn into electricity, photovoltaic. Okay? Those are the panels we see all over the place. They're some on your way to Granite there, or if you go on Joshua, you have to look behind the fence. There's some down on Navajo, they're all over the place. So hopefully on people's houses, they're on top of the parking lots. <coughs> uh, they're producing electricity generally, yeah, uh, directly. Okay? The trick with these is they're still pretty inefficient. They're only 15 to 20 percent efficient, and hoping that Tesla and some other people are going to come up with much more efficient systems. So at the moment, I personally am against these big solar farms because they tear up a lot of natural habitat in the desert. They create an eyesore and are, are pretty unsustainable, and, and we won't be able to do that much in the past. But I am totally for them in a decentralized fashion if you put them on houses, you put them on parking lots, you put them on warehouses. Generally, we talk about that as rooftop solar. Um, makes a lot of sense, and uh, and we're we're doing a lot of that as a society. Okay, uh, next one. Any questions on solar? Anybody? Anybody? Does that give you a little bit better picture on what solar is? And that's all we're going to really cover in this. Is okay. We talk about renewable energy uh, as opposed to fossil fuel energy. What is it? So that hopefully will give you a little better. Any, any questions on solar? Liz, could you? Four. Just Four. think in now. Yeah, we, we, we're going to go till, uh, we, we need to stop at nine. Ten more? Ten oh nine. Okay, well, Granite Hill is going to fade out. Anyway, yeah, will be recorded for you guys to get this later. Okay. Uh, hydropower, this is when you take falling water, the kinetic energy in, in water, and, and produce energy uh, energy from it, most of the And that's 60% of the world's production. Countries like Costa Rica, it's 90%. You've got mountains and lots of water. It's a wonderful way to do it. And it's been going on for a long time. This is a form of renewable energy that's been around for a long time. Uh, large scale hydropower. I think this actually might be. I think that might be a dam or one of the Colorado is what it looks like. And, you know, we dam the water up for various reasons flood control, water storage. But then we produce this amount of hydropower from it. Back to go over to Victorville, most of those lines going through Victorville are coming from the Colorado. The LA Department of Water Power owns a lot of that. LA DWP owns a lot of that power, and a lot of that, those transmission lines coming through, uh, let's see, northern Apple Valley, Victorville, are coming from some of the, the hydropower plants on the Colorado River. I mean, cutting down on CO2 emissions. It's low cost, it's a large untapped potential, and it's high net energy yield. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of wind power? 10.4. Wind is, is also, and well, actually, no, it's not also. Wind is an indirect form of solar energy. How do we get wind? We have heating, for example, out 
Satya and Hesit out beyond us on a day, for example, we, we have upwelling of air, we have a low pressure, and then air from, from, from a higher pressure, like over towards LA, comes blowing through the Mojave, through the Cajon Pass, and out into the desert. That's why we get those, those afternoon winds that you guys are all so excited about, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> catch you guys. Don't forget that uh, your don't forget your uh, quiz four today. Okay. Got a question, Mr. Huffman? We'll keep going a little bit. Good. Okay. All right. It's the second fastest growing energy source. Um, wind farms uh, on land offshore. And we all know on the way to Palm Springs, going over to, to Hatchapi, we got a bunch of, of wind farms. Locally, the people have decided this isn't a good option for us. We don't have very consistent. Would you have questions, Mustafa? No. Okay. Not um, good. Yeah. Um, so we've decided locally as a community pretty solidly, and we've recommended to San Bernardino County that this isn't something we're looking at. We 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 would like to use renewable energy more in the form of photovoltaic panels, more in the form of direct solar. Okay, net energy yield is high, widely available. We are also uh, producing quite a lot of this in the upper Midwest, Wyoming and places like that. And that's being transmitted to Southern California. Um, big thing from Edison right now is they're asking us to build new transmission lines and new substations to pick up that energy that's produced by wind up in the northern parts of, of, of the United States, Wyoming, like I said, Montana. Um, you know, so, so there is wind energy available locally for, for eyesore reasons, bird reasons, for various reasons. We don't think efficiency reasons. We viable thing. We've had two major large projects that the people, local people have turned away in the last few years. Okay, and I was involved in some of them. Okay. Another one that we can use as renewable is biomass. So this could be from plant materials. It could be from animals. So remember you guys, we went um, Doing directly things like they had wood chips there, right? Uh, in past, they've actually got the decomposed waste biosolids from the wastewater treatment plants, right? Um, and or we can turn them directly into biofuel. So biofuel is something like ethanol or biodiesel. Okay, so we can turn them directly, like you saw at Mitsubishi, or we can turn these this biomass biofuels. Okay. Um, sources of the biomass, agriculture. Um, we can actually deliberately grow plants for this. Things like switchgrass that grow nice and fast, or trees and plants, and, and use that for biofuel. You need to think about this. For most people in the world, their biofuel is wood, which is using to basically eat the house. Right? What aren't too excited about, um, most people aren't too excited about, is using food crops like corn and or sugar cane, of course we don't necessarily need or sugar cane anyway in our diet, but uh, excited to use them for uh, biofuels, because ethanol from corn, like I just mentioned, has a very low net efficiency, net yield. Um, if you want to collect crop like uh, we cook for bales, for example, and animal manure. Lots of people in the world cook their food over over uh, cow manure fires and things like that. And then another source is solid and wastewater treatment plants. So rather than putting our solid waste, like all our tree trimmings, just into the into the, the dump, why don't we actually use that as a fuel, as an energy source? And then of course deforestation and biomass reduction, okay? Those wood chips you saw out at Mitsubishi were actually coming from where they've gone up into the, up into the mountains, our San Bernardino Mountains, and they've
thinned out the trees, especially the trees that were killed by bark beetle, so that they would reduce fire hazard. And those wood chips are what you saw there in that big stack at Mitsubishi. Right, so um, some of the tra trade-offs and disadvantages and advantages. Um, you know, advantage is it's easy to get to, it's sustainable, pretty sustainable. Problem is, if we deforest, like at bottom picture there, um, it could cause deforestation. And uh, generally, they, they're not very, they don't have a very high, huge, very high energy yield, it's kind of medium. So we get a lot of pollution caused by, by biomass, by burning biomass directly. Mitsubishi is a, a exception because they burn it very hot. And remember that chimney basically what had a scrubbing system, a cleaning system to get rid of any pollution. All right, so liquid biofuels, who produces them? Brazil, United States, Europe, China. There's our ethanol again, and then the, and, and, and a few of the issues with it. The very bottom is important, is if we don't use a food crop that people eat, or even animals eat, it's called cellulosic ethanol. Basically, it's just a crop that's grown for, for making ethanol or biodiesel. An example of that is switch crops. grows very quickly, and once we have that technology in place to where we can com convert that into fuel, that'll be a very good option. Geothermal. Anybody know where there's any geothermal energy around here? It's right there on the slide if you can see it. But Salton Sea, if you go down to the Salton Sea, all around the Salton Sea, you'll see these big energy plants producing electricity. And they're using the heat from, from the earth. That's geothermal. Mammoth lakes, most of Mammoth lakes is powered and heated from, uh, from geothermal. Okay? It's uh, very efficient, it's reliable, it's environmentally clean, and uh, it can be very cost effective. But you've got to have access to upwellings of magma and, 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 and heat that's close to the surface, okay? So it depends on where you're, where you're located. Okay, hydrogen, we're not gonna really get into this. Um, still, all I'll say about this as a fuel source is it's still in early development stages. Um, it, it can be incredibly efficient and incredibly uh, sustainable, but at the moment, we're not quite there yet. Okay, so real quick, probably got about a minute. The last part, the most important part, is how do we transition to a more sustainable energy future? Uh, we need different kinds of policies. And there's the main one right there, the second, the first bullet. A gradual shift to smaller, decentralized micropower systems. Why are we still producing our electricity for California in these massive coal-burning plants that are out in Arizona or even all the way into the Midwest. Why are they there? Because they're very polluting and California's laws won't allow them here. But their energy is coming all that way to California. Whereas we could have a lot of solar, um, a lot of other kinds of energy, mostly I think solar is mostly the, the idea. And people like Lucerne Valley, little old Lucerne Valley that everybody thinks of as a hick town they actually are developing their own microgrid where they would produce their own energy. They would put in a solar plant out on that dry lake that they have uh, off to the north of town and they would have their own microgrid there, okay? Um, and, you know, we just have to move away from using fossil fuels in such huge amount. And the technology's there, it's just gonna take some time. Okay, and then the last slide is basically looking at some of the alternatives. And it's gonna take a mixed bag, but they'll have to be decentralized. All right. So I think that's the, pretty much the last slide. And then the last part is what, what can you do to shift to a more sustainable energy future? There's things that, again, the person... Bye.